Some didn't care, and some didn't even know anything. So we organized this little project, and it looks like there's a, a big turnout. Again, my objective is we all have a voice. I went to the February 6th, I believe, meeting. I wanted to have the microphone. They didn't give me the microphone. I think there was too many emotions in the room, and some people were talking. The June 6th meeting was going to happen, and then it disappeared. I talked to my wife, and I said, why are we being reactive? Why can't we be proactive and just get the community together for us to know each other and to have a voice. So Adam backed me up with this and it grew to this many people. So I'm a neighbor just like you are. I'm gonna give it back to Adam and we can discuss this openly and figure out what we can do to maybe persuade these developers to build somewhere else. I think it's a beautiful project, but not my backyard. They can do this anywhere else. And I'd like to understand the motive. My motive, I like my neighborhood the way it is. I don't have a dog, I don't have a cat, I don't have children. I'm not blessed with any of them. But I see children, and we were all children at one time. So it's got to affect you regardless what age you are. Children like to play, dogs like to walk, deer like to come out in my backyard and eat all my vegetables. I'm okay with that. I don't want a, a double line in front of my house. I don't want them to feel that they made a mistake and they underestimated the traffic. So now they're gonna take five, five feet of your property and make the, the road wider because of their insecurities and not knowing the level of traffic that we have. So I'm afraid of traffic lights. I'm afraid of double lines. I'm afraid of those stop signs. It's a neighborhood where it's peaceful and quiet. Why can't they go somewhere else? Many people have said, we don't need a market basket. There's a stop and shop in Whole Foods walking distance. They can go there. I can find five different properties for them to build and I'll help them do it if they want to. So Adam, here you go. Thanks uh, everybody, thank you Tony. I'm Adam Steiner, I'm a counselor from District 3, and as Tony mentioned, I live on McAdams Road. And uh, I gotta give a th big thank you to Tony, because this meeting would not have happened without him reaching out and saying, hey, I live on Livoli, and I heard about this crazy project idea, and I was like, wow, like this is a guy who's involved, he's interested, this project would decimate Livoli, and he wasn't even aware of it. And so I knew I gotta do a better job making sure the word gets out there. So my hope is today, all of you take this information and you're able to share it with five of your neighbors and we can make sure that everybody who lives in this triangle and around this triangle knows about this, isn't aware of what's going on and keeps an eye on it. I also have to thank uh, Councilor Long, Christine Long, who represents District 1, where we are right now for jumping on board. She knows zoning better than anybody in Framingham. And she also knew that the community room here would be a perfect place to have this meeting. Yes. And thank you to Mary and the Shulman House for, for hosting us. I was like, all right, we'll just hang out in the park and have a chat. <laughs> Given the weather and the size of the crowd, I don't think that would have worked. So thank you so much for arranging this. No problem. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the point is definitely that we want to bring awareness. We want to bring sunshine on this scheme to make sure that everyone knows what's going on. And th that's my main goal. Now, why I'm personally opposed to this, uh, I'm going to borrow from Tim Owens. Is Tim here? Tim, thank you for joining us. And Tim said it very well on Facebook, three good arguments for why this is not the right project for our area. Uh, the first is traffic, which we all know is already horrible in our neighborhoods. And when they work on the plaza intersection, the traffic goes right through Lavoli, it goes to McAdams, it goes to Claudette, it goes to the entire neighborhood. And with this supersized project, how much worse would it be? Uh, not only during construction, but afterward. And we have the plaza being built out right now, um, which I guess 
maybe that's where we should start, is making sure everybody's aware of what we're talking about. Um, and I'll let Christine give more detail, but right now the plaza is under construction. There's a big dirt pile there where the supermarket was. That is not what we're talking about. That is a project that's been worked on for years and years, and I think some people aren't thrilled with it, but it's the result of a lot of open discussion. And I, I'm a supporter of that. What we're talking about is a proposal for the other side. This triangle, Edgel, Edmonds, Lavoli, there's a proposal to take, and there's a few more properties, but take all of this and change the zoning to allow for big apartment complexes. And it would basically turn Lavoli into another Route 20 or Edgel Road. It would destroy Lavoli. Uh, the second is community. You know, we're trying to build a community in Knobscot, and that's why I support the Plaza Project, because that's going to have stores and shops. We can already see some community being built in Knobscot uh, with the um, a new gas station that's going to have a bigger store. Uh, we have a hair salon. Now we're going to have stores right on Water Street. We have Knobscot Park, which I would like to stay a park so we can hang out there when we're only going to have five people and the weather is nice. <laughs> Um, we want to build community, and this would disrupt all of that. And then the last thing is waste. Uh, as Tony said, there are other properties in Framingham that we know, like the way the plaza was empty for years and years. You know, you think about places like State Lumber off of A Street. You think about even Pinefield, uh, which, uh, you know, the plaza itself is great, but it has this giant parking lot that's more in line with 1986. You know, when I was a kid, going there, not now. There are other places where there are openings. What we have here is a lot of residential neighborhoods and trees and forests and things that are actually important when you dig deeper. You know, being able to live in a neighborhood that has forests you can walk around in, that has fresh air, that has a park where you can go hang out and have a picnic, where you can have a meeting on a Sunday morning. Those things are important, so we have to protect them. So those are the reasons why I'm concerned and, why, and that Tim uh, very nicely expressed on Facebook, and he probably could do a better job explaining them. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Christine now to fill in some of the details that I missed. But thank you all for coming today, and um, I, I definitely appreciate you coming out in the rain. Thank you. Yes, I'm Italian too, but I guess I'm not as loud as Tony. <laughs> So the history of the Knobscot rezone goes back not too long ago, but it took us probably 20 years to get to what's going on in Knobscot Plaza right now. Uh, when we did examine that, I was the chair of the planning board at the time. I spent 12 years on the planning board and seven year chairing it, working with the former administrator to come up with exactly where we should actually zone Knobscot for commercial district. So currently, what happened around 2018, um, the zone did change, and it only included the existing commercial parcels that are already there, because we wanted to give them the opportunity to be able to redevelop with some mixed-use component to revitalize the area. So as you see, the Knob Scott um, Plaza, it's taken this long just to get this far, so that's two years later. So ultimately, there was discussion about expansion into this parcel because obviously there was a developer in the background that was trying to push for that with some of our members on the planning board and that got shot down. So we spent a lot of weeks discussing where the map would be, where the districts would be, uh, the district line for the new B4 commercial area mixed use would be. And what, you, what we have today, I believe shown on this map, is what we have, and that's what we want to stick with. So there's really no reasoning, no real cogent reason why we, we would want to change the zoning at this time, because we haven't even experienced what the outcome of the existing new zoning for B4 Knobscot Village is going to be. And I know it's called a village, but there's so little commercial in Knobscot, and it never was intended to be anything but residential with a very small component of commercial. Similar to Saxonville in a way, um, our central business district downtown is the housing choice MBTA parcel that uh, when I was on the planning board, that was another thing we did back in 2015 ahead of the state's initiative. Uh, 
Department of Housing and Community Development, which is no longer DHCD, it's now Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities, EOHLC, is on a big drive for more residential um, for housing. They're more towards apartments than single family housing, but housing is really what we need, not more commercial properties. Um, so I think, I don't know if we have questions, and I actually, if um, one of the counselors at large wants to speak, I think that would be appropriate for their point of view on this. George King? Yeah, no, come on, take the microphone. So, I mean, I have a lot of knowledge about the area and about the zoning and what's going on. I will tell you that the developer is actively soliciting all the homeowners along that property line to try to buy you out. So be aware that you may be getting phone calls. Anybody that lives along that line on Edmonds, they are looking to buy you out so that they can expand that even further. Thank you, good morning. Uh, I don't think I have a whole lot more else to add. I think that was pretty well, uh, you know, recap. I think the one thing that I would add is I think everyone gets confused, myself included, when it comes to how projects get approved. And the one advantage that we have in this particular situation that Christine alluded to is right now that area is zoned as a residential area. And for the most part, at least, if not all of it, I think all of it is, all, all of it is R4, which is one acre zoning. So unfortunately for the people who bought it, without getting that changed. They can't build that, of course, anything they want to build. They only can build one acre of zoning for residential. And the only way that changes is a two thirds vote of the city council. That means eight of the 11 city councilors would have to vote to change that. So I know for myself, I think others said, I said last year when we met about this, this thing is dead in the rival as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't make sense for the particular. <laughs> And it doesn't make sense for a particular project in that area to come in there and do that. So why would we give that up to change that zoning? So Janet, who's here too, had a, Janet and I had a meeting on the site. Some of you were there last October, right before it got cold. We uh, had our office hours on the site. It was interesting to hear everybody's thoughts and concerns. And in reality, it hasn't really changed much since then. I know they were talking about having a meeting with the developer, but they're kind of stuck. To be honest with you, they, there's not much they're going to be able to do as long as we hold that and remember that it's going to take a two thirds vote of the city council. They can't do any of the things they want to do, and that's the part that makes me feel much more confident about this going forward. So, thank you for the time today. Thank you. Well, there's really nothing left for me to say because pretty much everybody said it. Um, I met a bunch of you at that meeting that we had at the park. And you know, I my actually my house is right up in the end of water. I'm on Sire Mill, and so we have a lot of uh, we're right by Hemingway, so we deal with a lot of the traffic that goes this way. And so we're you the Knox the Laboli folks are basically have what we have, but we're on the other end. So um, to George's point, I mean, I think we made it pretty clear at the city council um, when this first came up. Uh, the zoning change is a huge thing, and that's why the bar was set high to have a two-thirds, um, not a simple majority. Um, and I think that you'd have to show a reason and a pretty good one for um, such a substantial zoning change. Um, and I think that most of us, most of us have said that. And there is like close to 30 acres there, and I know it's two parcels, and one is. To currently now with some, some um, they're waiting on. I, I don't know what. There's it's an like offering. Legal issues going on. Yeah. So I mean, it, it's it's a high bar for them to get to. So I know that we don't really have anything new now. The last thing I had heard was that they had pulled the plan or pulled the meeting because I guess they were working on another iteration of the plan. That's really the last thing that I heard. But. I think that until they can really come before the council to show us something that would be a real need, uh, and I just don't see it with this scale of density. So George and I are um, always open where, you know, we cover the whole city. So we not only hear Nomscott, um, we hear South Side, we hear East Side, we hear West Side. We deal with all of the projects and um, neighborhoods 
all over Framingham. So this is um, just one, and we both live pretty close. Um, so we see the effects of it, but um, we will definitely be open for any questions. If you guys have, you can always reach us online, um, Facebook, everything. All right, thank you guys all for showing up. Yes, my dear. Could you point out where this building is on there so we can get a perspective? So this, so here's Gianni's, and then here's the TD Bank, and Showman House is on the left. So right there, and then, <laughs> yeah, right, there. right there. And so for scale, my house is here, and then water, um, right across at the edge of the um, Hemingway School is right there. So Bacon Road here goes up. So this is the scale of, yeah, and then over here is Lavoli. So you can see it goes from Lavoli here to Edjo. But it really. So, no, it's right here. So this oh, whole, right. It's a whole, right, that whole. It's this pink, this green thing there. But just for scale, just to show you how dense this area already is. So, all right, thank you all. So. <laughs> Do you want this on? Yeah. So, this is approximately 27 plus or minus acres that is being, what the developer is doing is consolidating property. Somebody owns one section of it, they, another company, another developer owns another one, but they have one guy that's trying to consolidate all of these properties together, including other properties that they're trying to buy out on the other side of Edmonds Road to consolidate even further and expand even further, which is why I say you may get phone calls if you're out runs along Edmonds, they're trying to buy all those properties up to make a consolidated plan of one whole giant plan, which would definitely affect Knobscot negatively. Christine, can I make one comment before we? Sure. I just wanted to clarify one other thing too. So they're asking the city council to rezone this area, which would allow them to do just about anything. They're showing a lot of pretty pictures of sort of the best case scenario if we did this rezoning, but there is no guarantee that if we did this, which it sounds like we're not going to, that they could do a totally different project that's even worse than the pictures they're showing. So don't, you know, don't fall into the trap of looking at the pictures and saying, oh yeah, that looks pretty good, I would go with that. Um, we need to be aware that once we change the zoning, there are new rules and they can go back to the drawing board. And so the question we wanna ask of our counselors and potential future counselors is would you change the zoning? Not do you support this project because we don't really know what the project is. And the answer to would you change the zoning needs to be no without any ifs, ands, or buts. Right. A lot of questions. Yeah. What's the timeline? When would the vote be? Never. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have a vote. When it you know, they were going to bring it to the city council, I think, they, which was months ago. I think they realized that it was not going in a good direction, and they took it off the table. So until they, uh, they brought a citizen's petition. There's a arcane rule that if you can get 10 signatures supporting, of anybody in the city, supporting rezoning, then you can be put on the agenda of the city council. And so they did that, and uh, but they withdrew it. So until they come back, we're kind of in a holding pattern. Uh, so why don't I uh, call them, folks? Yeah, why don't you call them? Cody, 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 Cody back there has got his hand, but he's been waiting. He's, he's, he wants to. Say All right, we'll go to Cody, and then we'll come up. I just have a really quick question. In the last meeting, they mentioned something about I think it was a Massachusetts uh, housing choice, yeah, I can which would reduce that. it from a two-thirds vote to a simple majority. Is that applied here, or is that not that? Sure. Yeah. So. What they're talking about is irrelevant to what's going on. A zoning map change always requires a two-third vote of city council. Um, they, I, my, I suspect the reason they canceled their meeting on June 6th is because they went to the planning board and asked them, told them they were going to go and ask uh, the state if they, if that parcel was a housing choice parcel, and um, I have told them several times it's not because it doesn't have an MBTA component in it, nor does it fit the uh, description of a housing choice parcel because of that. It doesn't have the infrastructure. 
So C the CV district, city council, uh, town meeting, whatever, we designated the CV zone to be the, the um, housing choice parcel. So we already have one, we're not compelled, or we don't have to comply with additional parcels being changed to that designation. Um, and they have to have certain requirements in order to be designated that housing choice parcel. So I think what they did is they asked that question and they got rejected and they found out that it's in fact not a housing choice parcel and that we already have a designation in the TOD CB district. So the short answer is no, no matter what, it is not a simple majority. What is a simple majority is if they came in after, say that was zoned, for multifamily and they came in with a project that does apply to what they're doing. The project itself with multifamily would be a simple majority, but a zoning map change always, always, always under 48 Mass General Law is a two thirds vote of a city council to a town meeting or whatever the uh, municipal body is that's voting on it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, we don't want this whole big thing with shops there, but can they just build apartments or? No, not under the well, current zoning. Yeah, they'll do anything. No. Well, but that's, that's without changing the zone, can they just come in and build apartments? Okay. No, absolutely not. They can build single family homes and they can build, uh, yeah, why? <laughs> cluster development. So, yeah, yeah. Stay that currently way. they can build cluster development. There is a or OS. Uh, yeah, open space plus a development zoning regulation in that district, but it's not a project. Like it's not for multifamily. Yeah, do, it's like what's going on in Millwood. Those type of developments. It gives the, the it gives the developer a bonus density for building denser and more housing, but it does not allow for multifamily. So the only thing that's allowed on R four one acre zoning is single family houses and open space plus a development. That's Christine, can you can you repeat the original question for the people in the back? They didn't hear the, the question. The question was, can they build apartments in that area? And the answer is currently no. Yes, sir. <coughs> could, you, could you point out, which, from the uh, intersection southwest, could you point out which areas are zoned what? And what the implication of changing the zoning would be? Yeah, absolutely. So the whole area that's the darker green, which is what they're proposing to change, is all R1 right now. The area in pink is the Knobscott Village zoning, which was changed um, partially to allow the plaza to be redeveloped, but it also applies to some of these other properties right around the intersection. Uh, the other side, which is the lighter green, uh, so here you could build single family homes, open space cluster development right now, not apartments. It's R3 over here. R3 in the lighter green area, which is also single family. Sim single family. What's the difference between R1 and R3? Question is, what's the difference between R1 and R3? Thanks. So R, it's R4. R4 is in the Northwest Quarter, and R3, I live on Hemingway, and Janet lives on Cider Mill. That's R3 zoning, which is 20,000 square feet, half acre zoning. So, so it's that's still- that's half acre, this is one that's acre. That's one acre, that's the difference. R1, you asked, that's 8,000 square feet. That's where the R1 lot, most of those are located on the south side, and there's a good per percentage of R1 all over town. And then we also have R2 district, which is the same thing, which almost is non-existent. I think there's like three houses in that district. So predominantly, we should talk about ADU also, because that's another thing that would affect us a lot. So let's not go there, Christine. What's that? Now you said it. Accessory dwelling units. Yeah, accessory dwelling units. That's something else that's on the table. Accessory what? Accessory dwelling units, which- In-law apartments. It's, oh. yeah, there, it, effect, it effectively would create duplexes all over town. So, but they want to specifically put it in R3 and R4. So, once again, we are targeted. Uh, yeah, we'll have a separate meeting for ADUs because I'm a, a big proponent of them. So, <laughs> sorry for those of you who don't like them. Uh, but we should talk more because there are some good things. All right, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I live on Edgel Road. I wanted to make two points. One is that the entire east side of Edgel from Gianni's down to Whiting Road is also included in the rezoning proposal and it's not in dark green on this map. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is that in there, 
pretty pictures. They had two um, access points on Edgewell Road to, in yeah. addition to that. I mean, can you imagine two more turns in and out? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Off yeah. of Edgewell, yeah. just, you know, before the lights? I mean, what are they gonna have? You know, a light every, every block? Um, but anyway, I just wanted to point out that it really, I feel like an imposter because I'm district two. Um, <laughs> I know my, my at large, my at large people. We here represent you. So I know you do. We got you. Um, but anyway, that should be dark green on uh, from Gianni's down to Whiting Road. And that last property before Whiting Road is mine. Okay, yeah, I mean that, thank you, Perry. I mean, their house was in the proposed rezoning and they weren't even aware of it. Nor are you interested in giving up house or having a giant road be built next to it um, so yeah it takes me it takes me five to ten minutes to get out of my driveway as is during during you know busy times let alone if when all this goes through yeah no i live on mcadams and i know china and i know some of my neighbors here when we try and take a left or a right out of mcadams onto edgel road you have to be very patient and I have a you know 16 year old at home with a driver's permit, and I'm like, listen, patience. Oh, I go, I go north. Yeah, go slow on Angel, please. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, can, what would happen if we all signed a petition not to change? I mean, can we present that to the council? Helps. Yeah. In fact, there was a petition to um, try and push back against this, but um, I would say if you sign our clipboard, if you didn't sign it, make sure your name, your email address, phone number if you want is on there because we'll let you know if this comes back and then, yeah, absolutely getting your name down that you are in opposition to this will be helpful. You can't leave unless you sign that. <laughs> and we'll have you clean the hallways. Yeah. It is optional for you to sign our signature papers for re-election when you leave too, but that's optional. Um, the question is about assigning petitions, so. All right, let's go back and then we'll come back to the front. Yes. Hi. Um, is there a way that community preservation funds can be used to purchase that land to make it a nice park for this area? Because we have no parks on the south side. Yeah. It would make a beautiful piece of land with little hiking trails back there. Uh, and I know other towns have community preservation fund and they have used money to buy land like this and build, uh, have like, like uh, preserved land. Yeah. Uh, so the question was about using Community Preservation Act funds. So you're talking about the south side of the intersection? No, the are talking about the whole park. Oh, can we then counter them and say, can we buy the property from you to prevent it from being developed? Oh. Uh, that's what they do in other towns. Yeah, so that would be another eminent domain question. And I actually brought that up to the Economic Development Director uh, and to see if we could do that. So the developer has to be part of that discussion because it's his property. But I brought that up a few months back that we should take it by eminent domain and use the preservation funds to buy it. So. Is there a way yeah. specifically for neighbors to sign a petition to be able to support that? It, it, you know, to be able to garner community support for that type of action yep. if you're taking it for the Petitions are good. Okay. Yeah. When you solicit petitions to the city, they pay attention. When you do nothing, no one pays attention. The more people you get to sign petitions, because we did that already with the petition against their petition to make sure it was a two-third vote. So you guys send it around, go to your neighbors, get as many signatures as you can and bring a petition to the council in. So that is the way to go because noise gets, a, you know, one thing affects the other. So the more noise you make, the more action you're going to get. No, if you don't do anything, nothing's going to happen That's and right. they win. That's yeah. right. Is that funded already? What? Is that funded already? It's what CPA? CPA, yes. Yeah. We, have we do have some money. Uh, 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 it, no, it was just a round of funding of projects, so... Um, you know, I think that you know there would be challenges with that because there's a million projects that want those funds, including ones, you know, on the, the south side of Framingham where there's less open space. Um, so what? I think it, you know, but if the developer says, "Listen, this project is not going to work, and we want a way out," I think this, you know, we will advocate for the city to put everything on the table. Let's figure out a way to get them out of here and to get the land back in a in a, in a way that we control its destiny. 
You're at the FinCom chair here. He might want to say something. Okay. <laughs> Do we know which lots are still pending? Because I know in the past they mentioned that some of the uh, properties that they are acquiring or try to acquire is uh, pending based on the project. Do we know what they 100% own and which plots are still, you know, kind of pending? I don't. We, I can get that information for you. I have that information. Yeah, I do. So make sure you give me your email, okay. and I'll get you that info. What was the question? The question was: um, so the developers have bought some of these parcels, and but some of them they've made conditional offers to people, like I will give you X amount of dollars, but only if it gets rezoned. Um, so, but and some of those are public. You know, they may have reached out to some property owners, and we don't know. Steve in the blue shirt. Yes, yeah, gentleman in the blue shirt. <laughs> Smart. That's Steve Kruger, hey, former Steve. town meeting member. Hi, Steve. Garvey ah, Rose. Speaking of petition, the leader, say Steve. The Sorry leader of the petition the back there. <laughs> okay, so Do you want the microphone? Come up. You know, as he's walking up, let me just say this real quick. We only have maybe what? One third of people that live on Lavoli or Edmonds or in the tri area. It's our job to tell a neighbor and get more people. And to your point, we need more people coming. And to your point, we need more people signing petitions. If we have more people doing it, my mother said, you're too loud, Tony. Screw it. We're loud. <laughs> we're, we're loud. We have to be loud. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get one started. And, I'll, and then I'll, I'll keep on telling another neighbor. But then everybody's got to do their job, right? I, I have to spend time with my wife, too. So <laughs> we all have to do our job. A perfect segue, because Steve here actually circulated a petition that did actually make a difference. Steve. Yay, Steve. Uh, Christine, could you clarify for us exactly what the status of this is? Because you keep saying this. The last I knew, there were um, there's some developer whose identity I'm not sure of, who got 10 signatures, actually, I think it was a little more than 10, doesn't matter, as long as it was 10, they submitted a proposal to the city to rezone this. And because of Massachusetts law, the city council had to consider it. Um, we, and, and then we did some research because the developer, whoever they are, submitted uh, with the petition a statement to claim that according to some provision of Massachusetts law, there was only a simple majority of city council required to approve the zoning change. So we did some research and found another provision of state law which said that if you get more than half of the owners of the land surrounding the proposed rezoning area, out to 300 feet, if you get more than half the owners of half of the land to oppose the rezoning, then it would require two-thirds majority of the city council. So uh, Christine has mentioned that state law says Two thirds is required for any zoning change, but uh, in ab abundance of uh, a caution, we organized this petition drive to try to get more than 50% of the owners of more than 50% of the land surrounding this 27 acres to oppose the rezoning. And uh, many of you participated with me in going door to door, we went door to door, uh, and we got close to 85% of the owners to oppose it. Don't forget business owners. Uh, yeah, okay, that's right. And that includes, by the way, the owners of the um, Gianni's Plaza, the owners of um, this other plaza here, and uh, I'm not sure which, which other one. We, By the way, we did not get the owners of the Showman House Why? to sign that petition. Why? 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 Because, well, you'd have to ask them, how many people here are residents of the Showman House? I would implore you, if we want to do another petition drive, I would implore you to start a petition inside Showman House. I'll take ownership of that. I'll come and meet with everybody here. To, 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 to you know, express your uh, desire that the owners of the Shulman House sign the petition that we submitted. 
It's their board. It's their board that didn't want to sign. It's their board that didn't want to sign. They didn't want to take a position. Yeah, uh, Christine says it was the board that didn't want to sign. But if we got enough of the residents of Showman House to encourage the board, that might be make a difference. It's got to be louder. That's right. That's it. We're going to all be Italian. That's right. Just one day. Just for one day. Louder with Crowder. We'll make it out for Carol Carter already. Right. Who owns this? I don't, I don't this, see this. Besides two, two life. life. Two is life. there a board of two life that we can yeah. get the names on? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Good. 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 Take it. Good. 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 And uh, we submitted it with a map that was color coded <coughs> that showed all of the you know the properties around the rezoning proposal who opposes it. And we colored all the properties that signed the petition in red, and it was like almost entirely red. It was a very effective visual graphic. And it was shortly after we submitted that proposal that developers withdrew their proposal to rezone. So last I heard, that was the only active uh, proposal that the developers had submitted to the city. Has, does anyone know where, where they stand now? Have they submitted anything else? Is there any? No, All right, it's so, in limbo. So I, wa so I wanted to clarify that then, because I wasn't sure. So there is currently no active proposal that's been no. submitted to rezone us. So, and, and that's important to know too. But if, if some new proposal comes out, then we need to be ready to uh, to move and act again. I think to Janet's point earlier, they're regrouping to figure out what they're going to do. So it's not that they're not actively continuing to find something to do there. They're, as I said, they're actively soliciting homeowners to try to buy your houses to make a bigger consolidation plan. And they're coming, trying to come up, and I actually did talk to Sarkey about this the Director of Economic Development. So they are trying to figure out what they can do with the property, um, working with the Economic Development Department. There was a question that did come to me if I would mind putting uh, apartments on that property. So I don't know what they're considering. I know that Robert Foley is the front man for these guys. There's two different owners of two different parcels, um, but Foley has pretty much got a big part of that. The bigger part of it belongs to the the Moulis Brothers. That's who actually owns that in the background. And when I was presented this, uh, it's almost two years, I think. So I actually have the plans they gave to me in person a couple years ago, and I told them we're not interested because the three plans that you see on their website is what they were proposing, and it's huge, and it's dense, and it's commercial. And it would have so many impacts in Knobscott and would change the face of Knobscott forever. And it totally flies in the face of our master land use plan for the designated, uh, the designated areas that we have put throughout town or throughout the city appropriately according to our master land use plan. So land use isn't something you just take a dart at and throw it and say, hey, I just want to put that there because I bought that. Land use should be done in carefully and it should be done with the whole community in mind, not just, oh, hey, I need to make some money, so let's put this in. So I'm aware of what's going on pretty much. I do work in Newton, I work in land use in Newton, and I just actually had a ribbon cutting of a big 55 unit elderly housing on Thursday, so we completed that $25 million project. I know True Life, who owns this, has got a bunch of properties that they're building in Newton as well. But as far as this goes, um, this has got a long way to go before it's going to even get off the ground. And I don't see any way this is ever going to get changed in the zone because it just doesn't make sense. On another side of that, I have had conversations with Garden in the Woods, who's also very opposed to this at the other end of Hemingway. And, um, the director, the current director, um, he would probably jump in on as well. As well, I had asked about if there's a way we can put this into permanent preservation um, for open space. So I'm looking at other ways to approach this. 
last note on this, I did ask the city solicitor for an opinion on this and she did come back and say it does require a two third vote. So I have Mass Law, we have our petition and we have the city solicitor's opinion that a two thirds vote is required for any zoning map change. So back to you, Adam. And I, I still didn't trust that. So I asked people I know who are connected with the state of Massachusetts and they, it's not a guarantee, we gotta keep an eye on it, but they said the state is very, very unlikely to stick their nose in and try and mess with this. So I feel pretty confident they're gonna stay out of it. Other questions? Yes, Norma. Um, I, I feel like a visitor from District 2, um, but as a long-time town meeting member, I represented the area that went out past the library and back. So um, I'm from Plainfield, so I'm a visitor. Um, but uh, I came here because I've been following this and I feel like there has to be a way to speak up to bullies. And this comes across to me as bullying. Absolutely. Buying up more property and trying to go around things and not being transparent. And it sounds to me like the main recourse we have besides all of us being educated and paying attention is to make sure that we don't elect anyone new to the city council <laughs> <laughs> or re-elect someone to the city council that would be happy to vote to rezone this kind of property. So um, your assignment is to ask anyone asking you to sign nomination papers and you have two at-large people here and two district people here. Before you sign the papers, make sure you know where they stand on this. And uh, we've got the rest of the city because uh, a city councilor who lives as far away from this property as possible, um, we need to find out how they're going to vote also. So I will be planning to ask the councilors from my district, anyone who's running or running for re-election, I will ask. And I would encourage all of you to do that and do sign their papers because they need your support if uh, they are in agreement with how And they're right here. Yeah. And they're right Thank here. Norma Schulman always <laughs> got here. So. The right stuff. Um, but to that point, District 2, this would absolutely impact you. Uh, Councilor Stuart Morales was definitely going to be here, but he had a family engagement that he was not, he wasn't able to get out of. Um, but this affects the whole city, so we all need to um, be aware of this, regardless of what district you're in. Yes, you've been waiting. We know what your votes are. What are your votes at large? Uh, I've already said that. I already said last year when it came for us, I thought it was dead in the arrival. I have no interest in it whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, you know, basically, we, you know, we, the whole city council, when it came before us, you know, everyone was listening to the neighbors. You know, you need to do a zoning change. You need to prove that it's needed or wanted. Um, and the density of this project is what turned a lot of us off. It's density. So, yeah. I go, it's money I heard, that's true. Yeah. But, you know, it, this isn't the first time for some of you who have been here as long as me. And, decades. Uh, decades, yeah. Decades. But uh, many years ago, there was a proposal here that, um, that they, under a different project, under a different Arch chapter Stone. of the law, where an apartment complex came in, they're going to build 300 units or something like that up there because they could, under Section 40B of the state law, which allows when a town doesn't have enough. Um, affordable housing to be able to do that without local approval. So they're going to come in and put that in there, if anybody remembers. But what we were able to do at the time was we count our affordable housing and prove that we were over 10% and therefore we effectively killed, which would have been otherwise an outright, an outright project on that land. So this isn't the first time that I personally have had experience with people trying to, I was the town manager at the time, decades ago, in the early 2000s. and. Uh, that's what happened, and that's what we were able to do. We were able to respond to it at that time and uh, kick that back. Because that had no local approval required. They could have went to the state to get that approved, but we were able locally, uh, with the help of some people in this room, actually, to uh, recount uh, 
affordable housing put us over the 10% limit and therefore we are no longer subject to that land. So I think over the years we've been sensitive to the issues that are brought there, there's the traffic and the topography and all the other issues that go along with it. Are we still over, George? We are still over. Mm -hmm. Which is critical for this case. The question is, are we still over? We are still over, otherwise if we weren't, somebody could come back and do that. Well, yeah, now the city is very aware of that uh, limit and making sure we're well over it. So. So, yes, we'll go to the chairman, and then we'll go over. I just had a quick question because I'm a little bit surprised. I, what I had read in the past was that they were looking at like maybe 200 apartment units and some a little bit of commercial uh, development, similar to what was uh, happening at the old uh, the old strip mall that was so at MD for so long. But what you were telling me is that there's almost, they're almost gonna double the size of the commercial space that they're able to build on, and then it's gonna be extremely dense. So it sounds like it's, they're like gonna double the amount of traffic that's gonna be in that corner. Uh, let me say something, uh, so the question uh, was, um, you know, how does this compare to the empty plaza project in terms of the density and the amount that they could build? And, and I'll let Christine fill in some details as well, but uh, the plaza project, plaza is, what, a five acre parcel? Or, or yeah. yep. We're talking about 27, 30 acres, depending on, you know, so it could be much, much bigger. And again, we're, they're asking us to change the zoning. We don't really know what the project is. They could get the zoning and squeeze in five yeah. Knobscot Plaza projects in there, you know, uh, or something like that. So, what they came in with, because don't forget, Demos Brothers owns a big section of that property. They told me, oh, look at the place in Maynard we did. Look what we did in Waltham. It's a mirror of what they did on 27, 20, uh, 27 in Maynard for Market Basket. And it's a mirror for what they did up in Waltham in an industrial park. Both of those parcels were commercially zoned already and, and industrial. So this is not anywhere near similar. And putting a market basket in there with housing and apartments, and, and uh, to I think Adam's point, there's three different. Um, uh, they want to put three curb cuts in there, so there'd be three ways in and out. So it, it just, I'm like, no. So I actually did get in a fight with Steve Cochinati. He didn't want to talk to me anymore because I just couldn't entertain the thought of the three different proposals he showed me. Or one was worse than the next. And it was all huge density, a lot of commercial, either a market basket or some other big development or commercial entities with apartments and then some single duplexes. And it, it's just bad planning. There was no rhyme or reason to why you'd want to do something like that in that corner when you have two, the Edmonds Road, um, these are all scenic roads, Agile, Edmonds, and they don't support that type of infrastructure. They were never intended for that kind of heavy industrial use. They were farm roads. So not having the infrastructure, we just reconfigured the intersection. That was a $3.2 million mass works project. And so now he wants us to redo the whole intersection to accommodate a new project. That makes no sense. Right. And he never gave me a call. Uh, this is all my district. That's my house up there. <laughs> my daughter drives down that road. My other daughter rides her bike. You know, so interesting that I've never gotten a call from them at all. Well, at the time, it was my district. Uh, uh, yes, the district <laughs> shifted, but the, now it's but, all, but these all are my neighbors. My house is over here. So. But we all have not things. got. Yes. I have a few people approach me putting signs up on people's lawns. Yeah. What can we do? What can't we do? Can, can we get people to put their signs up? Can we make signs? Can we educate? How do we educate yeah, more can, people? They do that in Newton. You're talking about signs against this yes, proposal. Yes, project, because more people have to know, right? More yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a good idea uh, to, to make signs, make homegrown signs, put them up. I mean, we have folks here, but you're, some of your neighbors have no idea about this. And so every way you can educate them, email them, social media, signs the old fashioned way, knock on doors. Um, make sure everyone's aware that this is out there. And then with this email list that we're going to be able to create, we'll be able to let you know if something else happens and then we can, you know, make sure the word gets out everywhere. And if you haven't signed up on that list, please put your name down there so we can communicate with you. Where is the list? So, so just fall, flip it over and just fill your name on the back. So, so what I... Real estate. 
Well, I'm in Newton. Every time there's a project in Newton and Whalen, you will see the neighborhoods have signs say no to this, say no to that, no big project. So I would say build signs, put them all over your lawns, because you can. Uh, Karen Margola, she's a planner, has a comment. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, I do live in District 1 because it stretches all the way out toward Potter Road. Um, and I was a former uh, city planner for Framingham. Um, I am on the Community Preservation Committee, but I am not here in that role at all, and I just want to be clear on that. <laughs> um, so first of all, I do agree with you that this should not be rezoned. Um, but I do want to express my own concern about the need for housing in Framingham and the, and the um, need particularly for housing for older adults, such as we have right here at Shillman House. And I was involved, in fact, in the development of this building. And this building put up, kept us over the 10%. So when we say, when, when George King said that we are immune to the state overriding um, 40B developments, it's because Shillman House put us over the 10% and kept us there. And it created incredible resource for older adults in Framingham. And I believe primarily it's Framingham residents who are filling uh, this building. And the need is immense in Framingham for older adults. So what, what I would like to say, I support what you're doing here. What I would love to see is a friendly 40B to put more affordable senior housing in this location. There's a real need. And to balance that against open space and perhaps even think about condominiums, which I hear all over and over again, for older adults in this community have no place to go and they can't find affordable condominiums. Have an affordable condominium, friendly 40B, um, which would be you know, one bedroom, one bedroom in a den, something like that, and help keep us over our 10%. I know, I know the city council has done a lot in that regard, but as someone who actually sees the need for housing balanced against the the needs for open space and the concerns of the community, um, I think that there may be a way for us to proactively say what we want here as opposed to what we don't want and to find some sort of middle ground where it's affordable housing. When I say affordable, 80% um, of your median income is, is basically over $60,000 in income. So we're not talking about very low or extremely low. It's really your really, It's teachers. It's you know, it's people who work in our community who can't afford to live here. It's our kids who can't afford to live in our community. I actually have a kid who's now applying for affordable housing in Wayland um, just because he can't afford housing. Um, so anyway, that, that's just my point. Um, I'm not here to talk against the need for more housing. I'm, I'm here to say that this proposal makes no sense. Commercial here makes no sense to me. And um, but, but this is a valuable piece of land, and they're going to keep coming back because it's, it's at a, a good intersection. It's a big piece of land. There's such an incredible need for housing. But there might be a way for us proactively to say what we want and then get what we want yeah. and, and insist on what we want and, and not be at the, um, you know, at the sort of the bullying of the developers. We can say this is what we want. If you're thinking of coming in to give us what we want, then maybe we'll go along. Thank you. That's exactly right. And, and I, I'm a big believer in that too. And I think everybody is here as well. I, I think we are being bullied. And again, my objective was just to educate everybody because I'm edu I was educated by Dan who lives on Edmonds Road. He's a master plumber. He came by my house a year and a half ago and I had no idea. So my head was in the sand. So now that I know, I want to tell as many people as I can. I'm telling neighbors as they're walking by. So all I'm doing is allowing you, have the Bill Belichick attitude. Do your job. <laughs> Do your job. Everybody does their job. Everybody tell two other people and encourage them to come here. If they're against it, wonderful. And that's what my goal was today. And I think I accomplished what I wanted to do. On the affordable housing, we are, we are over, to, I think we're at 11%. We just upped it to 13 or 11. Do we only go to 11? 
Yeah. And we put in more workforce housing, which does not require a government subsidy. So in Knobscott, it's a approximately 20% workforce and a new building. Yeah. A couple more questions in back. Yep, questions in back, blue shirt. Yeah. They both have a blue shirt. <laughs> Way in the back. So I guess my question would be if, if that's, you know, you're saying, you're saying what we do want, can that be done without changing the zoning? Like you said, like they can change the zoning and have that as like, this is what we're gonna do, and then once the zoning is changed, they can do whatever they want. Yeah, right. right? Yeah, we don't want to bait and switch. So how can you how can you say like we we want this, so we need to change the zoning and then because Right, so what Karen's talking about, something different, that's a zoning board of appeal. It will go to them. If, if we want to do that, they could do that without yeah. a zoning change. Right, so, but we're over there 10%. There isn't any reason to change the zoning. But we're over 10%, so that usually just applies when we fall below that. But well, we can do that by agreement. Well, we can do it by agreement. We were over 10% when we built here, so we can do it by agreement. If it's under 10%, you're under 10% affordable housing, they can force it on you without local approval. Over 10%, you still can utilize that section of the state law, but you need the local approval to do it. So something like Karen said could work. I'm not, I don't know anything about what she's suggesting, so I don't know if it's good or bad right now, but I would say this, the one advantage of that type of approach is it could be resolved without having to change the underlying zoning. So we control it right to the end, right to the approval of the permit, because you can build what's called a 40B project uh, with uh, in R4 or any zoning. But like I said, people can't do it by right here since we're over that 10% of affordable housing level. If we chose to allow that, we could do it. The way I understand it. Excuse me, I didn't understand you. That's okay. <laughs> yes, and then we'll go to the, the blue, uh, the the blue, with the blue sweater. But growing up in this area, I mean, it seems like we're becoming congested like a Boston. Is that where Framingham is going? Uh, all this building, we built so many condos on the other side of Framingham, and I drive over that way, and it's miserable. I just can't imagine bringing anything more into this area, personally. I mean, I understand housing is needed, but there's other towns close by that is wide open. I don't understand why we're bringing more buildings and more people and more traffic. And when we can't even handle what we have out here, it's just getting to the point that we're, we're just a parking lot sometimes. Is that what Framingham wants? Is that's what, it feels like that's what's happened since they became a city. Yeah. And it's kind of sad. Because I, out here to live in a city. I wanted it to be land and sea animals and it just seems like now we're just becoming Boston and that's not what people really came here for. So is there any way to just keep that land like it is and do something for the whole community to enjoy? I mean I'm okay for housing but I think we have a lot of people that's come to town recently. And we've had all those apartments built on the other side. And I hear they're not even low income housing. You're talking 3,000 and up to get in them. What was the purpose of that? Uh, that doesn't make sense to me. So I can answer part of, I mean, it's, I think everybody heard the question. Um, Framingham is not unique in looking for housing opportunities. In fact, the state lowered the guidelines for the zoning. That's because there wasn't enough open land. So they, what they did was they lowered the requirements. Um, affordable housing, which is different than low income, it's kind of different components. Um, workforce development, um, to Karen's point, anybody with young kids, they can't find places for their kids. People that are aging out and they want to go somewhere, you can't find anywhere. That's why a lot of people stay in their homes because they don't have anywhere to go. It's out of control. And I think Framingham is not unique to your point that you can't get anywhere. I went through Natick. You can't get through Natick. 
I can't get through Ashley. Well, I, and, and vice versa. But it, it's really, it's everywhere. It's parts of the Cape. There, um, the amount, uh, I'm also on the Premium Housing Authority, and the amount of the waiting list to get in there is anywhere from three to 10 years. And it's frightening because I have a lot of people that are aging and they have nowhere to go and they reach out to me and they say, hey, how long, you know, for, um, you know, 80, 85, you know, how long for a, until a unit opens up? And I'm like, you know, depending on the criteria of what they, if they're a veteran, if they're disabled, uh, puts them in a line if they live in Framingham, um, so I guess my point is that we had a long-term moratorium on apartments. I think it was 40 years. Yeah. So where everybody else around us was building smart, you know, condominiums and doing it where they, they almost saw down the road for the future. Uh, we didn't. We had that, mor that moratorium. Then when it ended, they just kind of went everywhere. And it wasn't because we became a city. It was because the moratorium ended. And then that's why at city council we did a um we did another moratorium like a short term because we were building so many without them being absorbed so we didn't know how the community was going to react were they going to sit vacant and then just turn into god only knows what down the road and that's a concern um but i don't have an answer to your question but i think i think i speak for most people that know we don't want to be a boston but we're also, how do we find the housing? Because the state's trying to find a way to get it into each of the communities, not just framing them. So um, that's kind of my thought on that. And I do agree with you that you can't get anywhere from anywhere, but I do find that everywhere, unfortunately. So but just wanted to. Doesn't that get taken into consideration, the traffic? It, it does, but, but not enough. One perspective I would add is it would help if the commuter rail wasn't like literally on fire and late all the time so that some people would <laughs> choose to take that and not drive cars, um, which is why Framingham needs way more parking than other communities because everybody has to drive because the public transportation is awful. So, all right, let's go to the young woman on the blue sweater's been waiting. Hi, um, hi, Christine, Kathy Mercier. Um, Christine, you're probably aware of the um, project in Newton, South Newton, where there was a family who sold a huge parcel, it was acres of land, but they, I believe they sold it to the city of Newton, and then the city of Newton worked with the developers for the appropriate project in that very residential area. And I believe you spoke about, um, this woman here spoke about CPA funds, and it feels like, how can Framingham get hold of some of, some of that land? I mean, because that is, that's the value right there. It's, it's that's the power. It's the land owners. We all know that. And how do we get some of that? And then we start to have power and control and get what we want. Just another idea to put on the table. Uh, and Christine, thank you for your knowledge of zoning. So, so and confuses us all. I've been here too long, like George, thirty years in accounting, but we just are suckers for punishment. <laughs> But to your point, what I said earlier, you need to put pressure on the administration, you know, because the CED, Community Economic Development Department, with the mayor, needs to jump in and take hold of this. Because typically, whenever we do projects in the past, the town manager, we had, um, our former town manager would be involved when I was a chair of the planning board, and we had projects that would come in that we wanted to change, we would sit down with the developer, work with them, figure out what's gonna work, what doesn't work. And I've done that successfully in the past on several projects where if there's things they come in, come in with that we don't want, we just let them know, we don't want that. Go back to the drawing board, this is what we do want. If you, can, if you can do that, great. If you can't, then no deal. But if we don't have the mayor involved in this and the administration, the community economic development director, then it's gonna be a tough sledding. So again, you guys get petitions, come out and make your voice heard that this is what we want. We want the mayor, we want the administration, we want everybody on board with this about what we want and what we do not want. Send a message to the developer through the administration. Most communities, the mayor is very active in projects and like 
Janet, I work for Newton Housing Authority, so I'm the construction manager, procurement officer, contract manager, superintendent, project manager, and we work, I work with the mayor, I work with the uh, planning department, Bonnie Heath, on projects. I've got a lot of different uh, sustainable projects going on that we're working on right now with the city of Newton. Um, and for affordable housing and et cetera and so on. But if the mayor's not involved and their departments aren't involved, it makes it very difficult. So I think that's what needs to happen. Question? Yeah, well, your answer to me about building apartments was they can't do that. But they can build apartments if they call it elderly apartments. So what George is talking about is a 40B friendly amendment and it would go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. It, so there's different types of projects they can build that way. That's how this project got built. And it's successful. Why is the mayor so Question? silent about why this? Why hasn't yeah. State Lumba? I don't know why the mayor hasn't made any comment about this. I have no clue. Okay, does he know we're about this? The, the of course he knows. The mayor's got to know everything. <laughs> That's not necessarily true. I've spoken to the mayor about it several times. The mayor is not in favor. But the mayor needs to come out and get involved. But let's not turn it into yeah, whatever. Why has State Lumber never been developed? It's been sitting so here for years. Tony Kwan owns State Lumber. He's got a 60 year lease with Stop and Shop Peapod on that property. He has no intention to do anything with it. He gets six hundred grand, six hundred thousand dollars a year for keeping that property vacant. So, and there's not much, we can't do anything about that unless we sit down with Tony Kwan and try to encourage him to do something. It's the same deal that happened with Knox Scott. They haven't, um, so these landowners have leases with stores and they have to get, they have to break that lease to be able to change it or they have to have an agreement with the leaseholder. So those aren't that simple. George knows more about that stuff. So. <laughs> well, you were the town manager. Well, <laughs> you, anyway. But, I mean, it's true that, that some of these grocery stores were paying. Sorry, they're all getting 600000 I, I don't know how much money, so I'll yield to Christine on that. But it is true that the grocery stores, like Shaw's, was paying Oxcott to be vacant and Stop and Shop's paying the other place to be vacant. I don't know why. To me, it's, it seems like competition wouldn't be as bad as paying six hundred thousand dollars a year. But you know, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, there are issues like that that we have to deal with. A lot of times, there are things that we can't locally control, so we just have to control what we can control and kind of bring this whole thing back to the beginning. The biggest control we ever have is what we have right now here with the zoning. As long as we keep that in control. We don't wipe out everything they can do. That case has been made by Christine in the question. They can do some things, and they can possibly do some things that would be unappealing, okay? They could, possibly. But that would take a lot more work and a lot more effort. For the most part, with the zoning as it is now, we're as good a shape as we can be in. Okay. We have the biggest protection, the two-thirds vote, to change that. Yeah, plus you have the biggest protection by voting the right people in. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of voice. Go here and then to the woman in back. Adam, just, oh. Can you ask everybody if they signed? Did everybody sign? Okay. Well, we got one more. Wait, attend, there's an attendance sheet to sign with your email, your name, so we can all consolidate and continue to meet and right. discuss this in the back. We'll, we'll go to you next, sorry. <laughs> As far as I know, there's nobody that is in favor of it. I have heard that some of them feel like, well, we, at least we should look at things. And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so you might want to reach out to it. All of our council information is on the Birmingham City page uh, under the council. And you can get everybody's contact information. And, and you can call each one of them. And I would encourage you to do that to get, you know, to find out what they have to say, because I can't speak for another counselor. I can only speak for myself. So, who did, there was somebody else? Oh, right here. Oh, okay. What's the name of the Facebook page? Uh, what Facebook page? A uh, Knobscot Neighbors, I think is the one that. Knobscot Neighbors? Neighbors? is a Facebook group where people share a lot of information. Okay. 
Yeah, and maybe we'll do five more minutes. Yeah, we'll, we I guess I have to get out. I know you guys have been really, very patient. Um, one of the things that came up with the question about the city council, like when it came up, some of the things were brought up was very true to Karen's point of something's going to go there. So you should try to at least have it's something that Framingham wants. And we talked about one of the things that had come up um, on over on Lachlan Ave a few years back, 10, 15 years ago maybe. It was a, um, they wanted to put in maybe 12 houses and the neighbors, they fought it and they fought it and they fought it and fought it and it went on and on. And then eventually they had the wayside group buy it. And then they, they knocked down all maybe 16 acres, hmm? maybe more. They cleared the whole, they cut down every tree, shrub, blade of grass. It's kind of a big, you know, to the neighbors. They left it completely vacant. I drove by it after it was cleared and I literally cried. It looked like an open football field. So one of the things that we had talked about was that something's going here. So we need to make sure that, you know, the neighborhood is protected um, and that we, the voices are heard, and that was what was said at the city council. So, not to speak for them, but to, to talk about what we we had discussed. Something is going here. Um, we know that, and we can't control. Like we talked all about, you know, different things. But I think yeah, that some of the things oh. that have been brought up about what we do want <laughs> does make a lot of sense. So, in closing, because I have to run, and it was great to see all you guys, and thanks for coming out. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Or, or nothing could go here, which is okay too for me. Uh, yes, Kathy. And then I think we'll take maybe one more question after that, and then we'll stick around definitely so you can come up and ask questions. But I, I don't want to ask too much of Shulman House because um, they've been very gracious to let us take over here. Yes, Kathy. Yeah, I wouldn't want to interfere with their lunch hour. Yes. Um, but I just want to mention Knob's got neighbors. There are two different groups. Okay. One is a Facebook group. The first one that started was on a, uh, it's a, a list, which means they're email based. Yeah, no, you don't have to worry about that. Okay. People post. Thank you. Thank you. Is there Everybody any way of getting the what the exact the proposal is, a copy of it? And that's democracy. Um, yeah, when I find out what it is, yes. maybe we should post okay. it Oh, you still don't know what's... Um, no, because no. they went back to the drawing board, so I don't know exactly what they're doing. So you, we're talking Facebook, about the apartments going in and... Oh, over there? Yeah. Oh, I hear you that. Most of, yeah. Yeah. Most of um, the Knobscott neighbors... Do I have your email? Don't No, don't put it on there. You know what? Uh, so I'll get you. I'll yeah. get you the thing through email. email. Okay. Out might include a link for people. We're all meet up. Yeah. Yeah. We we will we will do that. We'll so follow up this your, meeting. I'll turn your all your signatures into a, a nice list, and we'll send out a little background information and also links. Kathy's talking about there's an email group if you're not on Facebook. There's a Facebook group, and then in any case, you'll now be on an email list. And um, we'll make sure you're aware of as there are developments. Uh, uh, to that point, I wanted to just volunteer, like uh, to help out, to maybe get our own site going, and we can talk because I don't trust Facebook. And we're happy yeah, to oh, yeah, he's a tech guy. Facebook, yeah. anyways. So, uh, luckily, if there's anybody else who wants to help out, let's just uh, thing, yeah, let's circle the wagons okay. and uh, get some more information out to people uh, in another way. And, uh, but, Adam, I'll be in touch with you. So we'll send you down. Excellent. Thank you, Tim. All right. Thank you all. We'll all stick around if you have questions. Adam, and we'll be in touch soon.